Did you ever want to be a disc jockey? I would be a not in, DJ yeah. at bar. I mean radio. No, disc I know jockey. what you mean. I would be incredible. I did it a couple times so at funny. what's that fucking college in San Francisco that's not SF State? Oh, I was gonna say like, SF State. The, no, the Papist one. The, oh, University of San Francisco. University of San Francisco. I knew a lady there who yeah. was a, a a college radio Shout DJ. Out Bill Russell went there. Shout out Carolyn. That's the woman who let me DJ for her. And I played, uh, I was probably, no, well, we don't need to mention some of the bands I played on air, but some of them were had bad reputations, but it was really fun to do. Yeah. It, was, I, it gives you, I think there's a power in being a rock music DJ that there isn't in anything else. It's a lost art. Now, Liz, mm-hmm. all we can do, The Breakfast Club. <laughs> Welcome to the Breakfast Club. I am Charlemagne. With me is my beautiful co-host. I'm Liz. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. The God. Liz the God. And of course we have with us... This isn't the Breakfast Club, but Sway, uh, aka Young Chomsky, producing, and this is the Breakfast Club. Welcome to the show. No, it's True Non. Hello, everyone. True Non, the Breakfast Club edition. <laughs> um, Charlemagne, interesting name mm. that one. Charlemagne. Wait, you mean the God or the historical figure? The God. Oh, okay. I thought it was like wait. Is- I thought in my head, even though I was talking about Charlemagne the God, I was like, mm. does Liz think that the historical figure Charlemagne was some kind of primitive deity? Oh my God. Char- no, Charlemagne the current primitive deity. Okay, yes. So cool. Yeah. So cool. Hello, everyone. Hello. We have a really fun episode for you today. We do. We're talking Brace's favorite subject. Punk rock. I'm a I'm a chatty cat. I kind of tried to do that in a brace voice, but I couldn't do it. Do it. Did do, you it hear? do it again. No, I can't do it. Punk rock. Punk rock. Punk rock. Listen, I I I'm feel punk rocker. No, I can't do it. <laughs> I feel like when people think of <laughs> punk rock, they think of a a, a sort of uh, uh, an airhead kind of moron with mm. their you know their little shoelace tied around their head and their little studded leather jacket. But I was always a sensitive creature. Yes, you got a snow you got the snowman I got sweater the snowman on. Sweater. Again, so actually, I do I do have it. I only have like two sweaters. I like so that one. It's this one or the big big one or the Chinese shirt. <laughs> um, but uh, it's too cold for the Chinese shirt. My nipples would be chafing. So uh, for me, when I was I'm I'm gonna be self indulgent here for a moment. If you allow me, I my, shall allow my favorite band. Mm. Uh, when I was a Indulge young away. lad, I got really into the first like three CDs. I remember I got like a Ramon CD, a Dead Kennedy CD, and a Dead Boys CD. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was oh no, it was a Dead Boys record, which was. Wait, are you a Dead Kennedys fan? I am not. Okay, no, yeah. I was at the time. But sure, but that is a band I severely outgrew. Yeah, and I have a personal deep dislike of Jelby Afro. Yeah, I think due that- to a incident. I'm really – everyone listening, don't get mad at me. Outgrow that shit. They suck. They suck. They, they fucking suck. suck. The Dead Kennedys are not good. Yeah. <laughs> it's really bad. And the guy – I also saw him just – oh, he's such an asshole. I mean, I think Jello? he's just – Yeah, I think in re, now that uh, with my knowledge of the various neurological issues that people have, I mm. think he might just be autistic. I genuinely – I'm not saying that in a pejorative way. I think he really is. Or if the alternative is so grave – that I dare not speak it. He might be just be the biggest asshole in the world. Mm. Not the biggest asshole. In the world. Dead boys, however. Dead boys, fucking rock. And once featured John Belushi on drums, which great footage of that. Um, but I, when I heard the Dead Boys. I was like, this is so crazy. I love this. And I and I got a CD. My fourth CD was a compilation of. Uh, it's called like CBGBs, even though like none of the bands played on CB- <laughs> at CBGBs. <laughs> CBG also, it's like, what? I don't know why that, and now it's like an airport restaurant bar, CBGBs. Mm. But it was a punk club in New York that very famous. Uh, it was, I got the CD, and the fir- it was like the seeds and like 60s bands on it. But the first punk song on it was uh, Agitated by the Electric Eels. So agitated, so agitated. One of okay. the greatest Cleveland punk bands. And then uh, the Dead Boys and I think Sonic Reducer was on it. And 
but I, I introduced me to all this stuff, and it was like this kind of artier, different stuff. But it was, and little did I know, I had all these connections to Peter Lochner, which Electric Eels, Dead Boys, Sonic Reducer was originally Rockets from the Tomb song. And then I heard, I don't remember if I got it at Grooves on Market Street sure. from in front of the show, Kelly Stoltz, or from my dad, but I got Per Ubu's uh, Modern Dance LP when I was 16. Mm. And the record cover looks so different. It's like a sort of like Midwestern version of a Chinese, like a... Uh, 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 great proletarian cultural revolution, yes, like very dancer. Famous. Yeah, um, and I heard it, and I put it on, and it was like nothing I had ever heard in my mm. life. It was the, the the, and I would listen to it with like these headphones on my little record player, and it just the 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 textures of the sound and the instruments they used. It was so. Uh, uh, avant garde, avant garde, and it just, it just, it, I, I had no idea these vistas were available for for rock and roll music. Mm. And I went out, and I, as I say uh, later in the interview, I got <laughs> one of the songs tattooed on my arm at like a sixteen year old. Uh, and uh, you know, later I heard Terminal Tower, the singles compilation. It was just, it, it fucking blew my mind so egregiously that it became like an obsession with me. It's still one of my favorite. I mean, I listen to this record all the time the first three records all the time. Um, and Peter Lochner is just, is, is a, this figure that, that, that kind of flows through this stuff like the Cuyahoga river. Mm. Um, and I, you know, from my, like eventually getting really into like, like 16, 17 years old, getting to like Lester Bangs and all that sort of rock history. He's such a big figure with that, that it's just. For people who don't know who Lester Bangs is, First of all, who are you? Exactly. What but you second of all, about? can you explain a little bit? Lester Bangs was like the, basically the guy who invented sort of the modern form of rock criticism yeah. um, and was like this sort of experimental rock writer from the 1960s and 70s who kind of put his like – it wasn't this sort of academic or like – uh, you know, stuffy version of rock writing. It was like actual rock and roll writing. Yeah. And, you know, he was like very associated with Cream Magazine and I think fired from Rolling Stone, but it was mm -hmm. like this, it, there's a couple compil uh, 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 compilations, there's a, yeah, there are compilations of his writing, uh, Carburetor Dong, and I can't remember the second one. Um, but I read them and reread them and re I wanted to be him when I was. Like I was always 17. more of a grim girl, Marcus gal, but also I yes, would be girl market. Yeah, also also great though, and still around. <laughs> yes. Unlike in Berkeley, you know, I yeah. believe. I think so. Yeah. I think so. Um, and blurbed on this book. He is this book that we're about to talk about called "Ain't It Fun?" Peter Lochner, proto punk in the secret city, which is by our boy Aaron Lang. Who is you who might people know? Probably don't even know is our boy. Our boy, yeah, but long time boy. Yeah, uh, but uh, an underground comics artist who R. Crumb once called the uh, un the unquestionable king of politically incorrect comics. R. Crumb said that. R. Crumb said that about it. That's him. very cool. Um, but one of my, f I mean, my f my favorite artist and the sort of true and on in house resident artist. Uh, Aaron Lang. Yeah. And so we're here to talk about his book with him. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to True and On. We have been chugging down the Cuyahoga River <laughs> on our little steamboat willies going doot toot every couple of stops, and we finally landed in America's Jewel. Now, I know most of our listeners are effete artists from the European capital who listen to our podcast on their summer reveries they take in August, catching up on a whole year's worth of content in but a week while they engage in orgies and red wine drinking. So you may not be familiar with what we in America call the Bastion of the Western Reserve. They say there are two cities in America— Trying to think of a funny first one, and I'm going to go with Chicago, the greatest city in America, home of some of the greatest art going on right now. Everybody loves Chicago. Chicago is one of the places that all your friends move to when they graduate high school. It is a great city. Just playing. There is only one city in America, and that is Cleveland. <laughs> now, here to talk about Cleveland with us is actually Cleveland's highest IQ capping out at 75. Aaron Lang, here to talk about his book, Ain't It Fun? Peter Lochner and Proto-Punk in the Secret City. Aaron, welcome to the motherfucking show. Hello, good to be here. 
<laughs> Aaron, it's so great to have you. I want to say real quick that our listeners, while they may not have ever heard your name before, they might be familiar with your work because you've done a bunch of artwork for us yes. over the past four years that they'll be familiar with. Some incredible... Um, the, the first and only visual representation of Coindexter, obviously. Mm-hmm. Bush did 9-11. Bush did 9-11, yes. An incredible Osama piece. So many. A great Gilead. Oh, one that they have, people haven't seen but is actually my favorite, I will say, is an Austin Powers uh, True Anon sticker. Yes. Well, there's we the made. Gorbachev one, too. Yeah, that and one's the, good. Uh, and what else? I feel the you Gilead also the, the um, what do you call it, Cafe Lorenzo t-shirt. And the poster yes. in the... You've done most of our art. Yes. And actually a really yeah. great um, not-for-sale poster of the three of us that I have framed and hanging in my office. Me too. Which I should send you a photo. Very nice. Yes. Yeah, please. This uh, book, I, I was... We were chatting before we started recording, but I really... I just want... Because I wanted to say it on air. is so fucking good, Aaron. It thank is you. absorbing... I had no idea that I was going to enjoy it as much as I did. I couldn't put it down. The the I keep calling I want to call them plates, but that they're not plates, but the the comics are just incredible, but the writing is fantastic. I cannot recommend this book enough to our listeners. Even if you don't care about punk, it's not just about punk, it's about so much more and I can't wait to get into it. Um, but I just wanted to get that right off the bat that this this book is is really really something. I appreciate that. Thank you. So, Aaron, let's talk for a second. This book is it. This speaks to me, I think, on a level that it it may speak to few others because I am one of the people that is dumb enough to have really loved and looked up to Peter Lochner from a very young age. But for those of our, which we'll get to why that's maybe stupid later, but um, we we. Should contextualize for our listeners who is who's Peter Lochner. You you know you wrote this book ostensibly about him. I'm going to say the book is like forty percent Peter and like sixty percent Cleveland. I think in general, mm. if that. But it is, and I, I think it all works to contextualize Peter and tell that story. But why why Peter? Why did you want to write a book about him? Who is he? Well, who is he? So Peter is best known as one of the original members of the punk band Pear Ubu. Uh, but even that comes with caveats because he was only on the original singles and mm. he was gone before they even put out their first album. So The seminal, the seminal album, The Modern Dance, mm. one of the my Modern favorite Dance. records of all time. <laughs> Though one of Peter's songs, Life Stinks, does appear on that album. Mm. Um, and then prior to Pear Ubu, Peter was in a band called Rocket from the Tombs. Rocket from the Tombs never did any official recordings or releases, though they came out later, uh, like studio recordings and live recordings. Um, but Rocket from the Tombs' claim to fame was the members broke up and members went into Perubu and the Dead Boys. Which I, I think is, is important in just like the history of rock and roll in America because I think that they really, both of those bands are emblematic of two very different strains that came from the same source. The Dead Boys is like the rock and roll punk band. Like they are a punk band, yes, very, very much so, but like those are great rock and roll songs. I mean that first album is incredible. And then Per Ubu really was like went more towards like the jazz art mm-hmm. kind of stuff, which I think is more Free like, jazz, yeah, 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 yeah. And like, like, uh, synthesizers and, uh, yeah. and like, you know, weird electronics and things like that, which itself spawned like genres sure. and genres and genres afterwards. Yeah. They couldn't be, they couldn't have been more different. And, uh, and there's even like a, a third kind of connection because Craig, Craig Bell from Rock of the Tombs, he left and moved out to uh, New Haven and started a, a band called Saucers, which were more mm-hmm. like power pop new wave. Mm-hmm. So that kind of gets lost sometimes in that story. But uh, but everybody in Rock of the Tombs went off and did other things that were very distinct. But they took those songs with them, like Dead Boy songs like uh, Sonic Reducer and Perry songs like Final Solution. Those songs started with Rocket from the Tombs. But why Peter for the book? Like what specifically were, what made you want to construct the whole book about him? Because the book is, oh, is a history – of of Cleveland and like the secret city of Cleveland, but what what makes Peter a good way to tell that story? Um, well, there's a lot of lot of reasons. There's you know there's a value in scarcity, 
And with Peter, you have like a scarcity of not well, he recorded a lot, but you yeah. have a scarcity of a scarcity of good recordings. There's a scarcity yes. of information, and uh, that's compelling to people. And a lot's been written about Peter over the years, but it's very disparate and spread out. And so it's it has needed to be aggregated, that information. And also Peter was a zealot like figure in that he was just he was just so fucking pumped up with enthusiasm and amphetamines. Yeah, I was gonna he say. just he knew everybody. Like he was in he was in the folk music scene, he was in the poetry scene, he was a journalist, so he knew all these people. And on top of that, he was zipping over to, to Detroit to the cream offices where he was hanging mm-hmm. out with Lester Bangs. And then he'd zip over to New York City where he was going to CBGB's in Max's Kansas City and forcing himself on the scene there and just insisting on being friends with everybody. So mm-hmm. he knew Patti Smith and television and Johnny Thunders. So in this single person with a short life, there is just endless connections. Yeah, yeah, because that, that's something we should we should mention too off the bat here is is Peter Lochner died at I think twenty four years old uh, in was it like nineteen seventy six that he died in? Oh my god, seventy seven. Seventy yeah. seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and so for me, like growing up, very much interested in the history of rock and roll music, and then reading like I think a lot of of young rockers did. Please kill me, which he's mentioned quite a few times in, in that. Um, you know, he sort of was like this, like weird figure that was. I think I can't remember if it's. I think it's Lester Banks called him like the first casualty of like this new kind of music, and in many ways he really was because a lot of guys did die. I mean, a lot of guys he played in bands with, or that played in like the you know bands that came after bands, and you know all that kind of stuff. A lot of those people did die within the next like decade, definitely within the next couple decades. But Peter was really one of the first to actually like die as a casualty of this of this rock and roll scene and and, and uh it's it's just interesting that like a figure like this comes out of Cleveland and you're from Cleveland guilty as charged that was an accusation <laughs> and still in Cleveland right i was gone for a long time but yeah i moved back 6 years ago mm. Yeah, well, I mean, it's not a good time to live in it. No. <laughs> I was about to say it's not a good time to live in Israel anyway. So I'm glad you moved. But <laughs> That's a bad joke. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know if it's a good time to live anywhere. At least, it, like, Cleveland sucks. It mm. fucking does. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. There's good things here, and you can make a good life for yourself. And I don't mm. regret moving back. And like, I do like it here, but it, that's like weighed against other options because it's just like i can't afford to live in new york i can't afford to live in seattle you guys left san francisco i mean it's like (laughs) where the fuck do people live anymore i mean if you want to live in the country like i'm sure there's some like appeal to living like in rural maine but that's not who i am so like Mm -hmm. i don't know where you go in north america montreal's cool um but yeah it's you know what I mean? Like, there's just not that many options and good places to be that are affordable and where things are happening. Well, it's funny you say Cleveland sucks because I've always heard Cleveland rocks. That is true. That's, and you know yeah. what? I got to say, that is a motif during one point of your book <laughs> is that Cleveland yeah. rocks. But it is it is funny, too, that you point out that that song written by Ian Hunter and you rightly point out from his best record and really only good record. Um Cleveland has this reputation as, and I'll say this from an outsider who's been to Cleveland and has has had many connections to people from Cleveland, is I've never heard somebody from Cleveland or who's been to Cleveland say a good thing about Cleveland, and <laughs> it's it's almost like I I, I get tired of how, the way that sometimes people talk about their cities. You know, like oh it sucks here, but we fuck it, we're scrappy and we love it. Cleveland really does suck. I I, I went there and it was you know it, I I had an incredible time and it produced some of the greatest rock and roll not only from the 1970s but but the incredible bands to this day uh but it is it is like so emblematic i think of when people think of rust belt it's like detroit mm. and cleveland and it was this city and this is what's so much so striking about the midwest if if listeners have never been there 
you go to these places and you see these sort of like monuments to this great grand projects that are just completely like hollowed out and and empty. I'm not just talking about like steel mill mills or whatever, yeah. but like the 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 buildings downtown and these like you know these grand facades and these this architecture and that 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 is a huge part of the book is just the geography of Cleveland itself. Right. It's important that people I don't think people know that John D. Rockefeller is from here and that he made his fortune here. And Rockefeller was the richest person in the world. Mm -hmm. And he made that money in Cleveland because there was money to be made here through industrialization. And once like the railroads got going, Cleveland got going. And there were there's a whole strip of Euclid Avenue called Millionaire's Row. And mm. it was just mansion after mansion after mansion. So there was a lot of Gilded Age activity here. And let's be very clear, these people were aggressively anti-union. Yeah. They were, yeah, they were, they did some bad things. But also credit needs to be given where it's due. And these people did truly believe in philanthropy. They were elitist about it, but they weren't just hoarding their money or dreaming of going to Mars or doing very selfish things. They were building museums. They were building libraries. And these buildings are made of marble and they have artwork and they're ornate and they're a gift to the city that these, these people gave us that we still have, and they're not going to be torn down because yeah. of their scale and because that their uh, their purposes are civic purposes, public library, city hall, etc. Those types of buildings don't get demolished. They have a sense of permanence and they have a sense of dignity. Um, but then downtown is a ghost town and it's awful, but there's this grandiose architecture that kind of taunts us from the past and tells mm. us how we were one of the major American cities. Yeah, you talk a lot about, um, I mean, throughout the book, you you return many times to this kind of concept of psychogeography and how, you know, this, it really feels like, you know, there's like a kind of psychology to this place that imprints on you. You know, this what you're saying about the kind of this this um, the the past sort of haunting everyone that w it was always once a place of greatness kind of um, but will never be is kind of uh, always sort of running through these figures throughout these decades, even before you get into deindustrialization, it seems like yeah. that there's this sort of sense of the city as this um Kind of like it, like it's sort of like unmoored a little bit, um, kind of like floating along itself, or it's been sort of abandoned even before it was um, kind of made into something. If that makes any sense, Cleveland is very isolated, but not in a geographic sense, right? Because Chicago is only six hours away. Yeah, Columbus is two hours south. Pittsburgh is not that far away. You can drive to New York. You can be in New York in nine hours. Mm -hmm. You know, Toronto is not that far away. So it's not, but people here don't travel. And mm -hmm. in the, they're just, I have a hard time talking about Clevelanders because they're not stupid and they're not hicks, but no. they're, provin they're, they're provincial. That's like the only word to describe them. They're, they're provincial <laughs> mm. and they don't, they just don't know how the world works. And they're just kind of like lost in time and just like cut off from cultural currents. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's hard to explain. Um, mm. But I think that's what like allows such a like interesting and unique culture to develop. So you get these expressions, you know, throughout, and these like bizarre characters, which include, you know, as your book kind of starts out with a lot of serial killers, which is kind of crazy. Yeah. But these sort yeah. of like very weird um, psychologies that develop, social psychologies, and kind of the, these figures that that emerge out of Cleveland are so unique to this place because of that. You know, whether it be these um, figures 
uh, you know, these weird serial killers or, um, you know, the these, um, in, you know, incredible uh, niche, uh, you know, music scenes or comic artists or, you know, and, and all these people, journalists intersecting, right? Yeah. So to speak of um, the geography, the entire industrial section is in an area called the Flats, and it's the river valley where the Cuyahoga River goes through. So it's below you, it's lower. And then on top of it, above like a cliff, is downtown Cleveland. So I was just talking about this grand opulent architecture, but it sits upon this precipice of industrial hell. So it's, you can understand why I get a little romantic in my descriptions of it in the book, because it's a very... It, it is romantic in the in the dictionary, you know, definition of that word. It's visually striking. I tried to convey that in the book, but when I, you know, when I take the light rail from where I live on the west side to downtown, I go over this valley, mm-hmm. and it's, I don't know, it's it's like awe inspiring. Hmm. And this is where the river caught on fire. Yeah, I mean, you you know, you mentioned the, all the industrial stuff there, and it was it was. Um... I had known this just because I had looked it up, I think, when I the first time I went to Cleveland. Uh, but the river caught on fire multiple, multiple, multiple times. And Which so, is weird because that's not usually a thing that should happen to rivers. No. And that's, I would say, and I hate to say it, that's one of the things Cleveland's the most famous yeah. for, is having a river that caught on fire. But there was this, like, you know, there was these, like, leakages from the, uh, you know, all the industrial plants over there that where people were just kind of like, ah, that means the river is healthy if it's, like, glowing a little bit. Uh, well, they and weren't then it leaks. Just, they weren't leaks. They were dumping. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They were just dumping the 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 waste there, and then you know the 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 river is on fire, which is a a sort of dramatic scene in the book, and then a motif that keeps getting returned to. I mean, what do you think that sums up about Cleveland? Well, it's certainly a visual metaphor for just how fucked up you know the environment got from yeah. industrialization, and can you imagine what it was like working in these conditions? You know, there were, weren't a lot of safety regulations. And, you know, like as I said earlier, the industrialists were very anti union. So it was very gnarly. I'd also like to point out, uh, and I think I do mention this in the book, that these river fires happened in, in other industrial cities as well. Yeah. It was, it, was not un, it was not uncommon in any industrialized area before environmental regulations. It just so happened that the river fire in 1969 got covered by Time Magazine, mm-hmm. and it kind of went viral, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. But the photograph, the famous photograph, is not from 1969. There are no photos of the famous fire. They just ran, like, an older photo from a fire in like the night from the 1950s, I think. Mm. One thing that also runs through the book is the occult history of Cleveland as well. And that extends, I don't know if occult's the right word, but that extends to the architecture itself. And, you know, something that anyone who has like a cursory knowledge of the way that a lot of uh, American and French and, I guess, English architecture uh, has been done is they were they were o- almost like accorded to these like, uh, you know, Masonic uh, designs mm-hmm. or these... Uh, these these sort of designs that seem reminiscent of like the way that like people thought about nature in in, in France mm-hmm. um, and Cleveland's no different and so there's these sort of like uh, these these the boulevards that are constructed this particular way and I I feel like as returning to the map over and over and over as you do in the book um, you know it 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 just shows that there's almost like this occult leakage that happens in uh, in or this occult dumping I guess that happens uh, just on the streets of Cleveland. Well, I think it's important to stress that uh, the term occult literally means hidden, that which is hidden. Mm-hmm. It doesn't necessarily have to be a uh, black magic kind of occult. So you're talking, we're talking about things that are unknown, that are sort of not part of the conventional history. And in regards to some of the stuff in the city planning and the geography, I'm, I'm in no way arguing that there was some sort of like uh, sinister occult conspiracy by the uh, city founders. This is not a Da Vinci Code kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It's more like it's more like they were influenced by neoclassicism. Yeah. So they were they were doing these types of pagan things, though I think very superficially. 
And then, you know, there are two parts of the city, one at the museum and another part in the flats where the the landscape aligns with the solstices and the equinoxes. Yeah. Uh, and that's a fact. It just does. But you can't really find any writing about why they did this. They don't talk about it. And if they did, it's been lost. So why was it just a sort of decorative thing? Uh, probably because these people were Christian. And yet it's still there and you can still go there and observe the solstices and the equinoxes. And that's kind of powerful. And not a lot of people know about it. In fact, most people don't know about it. One of the big events in the book is Kent State. Yes. And that, I mean, I think... All of our listeners probably know what happened at Kent State. But you keep returning back to that event um, a couple times in the book. What I really like about this book, by the way, just to step back, is that you kind of, you're, you're able to kind of tell this, there's this sort of like long history that you kind of return to from all different angles and dimensions throughout the course of the book. And so as the book unfolds, you're sort of um, starting to see the same history like told over and over again from all these different perspectives, from all these different angles or different sort of um, narrative links, which make it very uh, unique and interesting. You get a really like holistic, I mean, I feel like I, I, I got a very holistic understanding of Cleveland, of this, like, sense of place. But I want to talk specifically a little bit about Kent State because um, not only was that, like, such a... That was, you know, a big event, obviously, in kind of turning the national sentiment of the war. But for Cleveland in particular, and for a lot of these figures in this book, in these kind of underground music scenes or whatever, this was, like, a defining, defining moment. So maybe we can kind of, like, run through a little bit about what happened at Kent State and what that kind of did to the city. Sure. Yeah, Kent is not in Cleveland. It's not even in the same county, but it's it's nearby. It's closer to Akron, which is... Um, Akron's mm-hmm. interesting, and it's too big and too far away to be a suburb, but it's also too small to be thought of independently. People from yeah. Akron mm-hmm. would disagree. It's kind of like a satellite city. Yeah. Yeah. Sort, of, yeah. sort of like how Tacoma is to like Seattle, Yes, yeah, yeah. The home um, of LeBron James, you, but you, also the birthplace, people don't know this, of Steph Curry. Do you, uh, Interesting. Did Same you, hospital. Do you say that also because, like Akron, Tacoma has a uh, unique smell about it? <laughs> the aroma Akron, of they, Tacoma? I, they used to say that you could smell the rubber in Akron. Yeah. Akron was where the good year and all the tire plants were operated out of. So Akron had an industrial history as well, but it was entirely based on rubber. Akron, though, does have its own airport, unlike Tacoma, which shares it with Seattle, SeaTac. Mm. So Kent State, though. Kent State, yeah. So Kent State was, everyone knows what Kent State is, and it was a huge deal. But growing up, I think it had longer legs here because I'd hear about, like, a a friend would say, oh, my mom, my mom was there. You know, my Mm -hmm. mom was at Kent State. Or like, oh, you know, our history teacher he went to Kent State. So you, you, as a kid growing up here, you'd hear about it a lot. And it had this kind of weight to it. And I don't know when I learned that members of Devo were there mm-hmm. and that Chrissy Hine from The Pretenders was there. So then when you have that direct kind of punk and new wave connection to it, you have to talk about it. Mm-hmm. And also that punk kind of came out as a reaction to and a response to the collapse of the hippie counterculture. And boy, when you're talking about the death of the hippie ideal and movement, well, murdered students, you know, yeah. shot by the government is a pretty blunt metaphor. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's like almost even not a metaphor, <laughs> right? It no, was no, like it isn't. A total inflection point. Um, and kind of this, yeah, this sort of like a switch got flipped almost. Like, you know, how you say this, this sort of, uh, you know, folk hippie, you know, we can all rah, rah, take it on together, holding hands. Bunch of kids get shot by the National Guard. Um, blood on national television. <laughs> uh, spill, you know, f- on the fucking sidewalk. And, you know, the response was, 
anger and and you know this this music that came out of it right this 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 punk response like let's talk about that well i think the immediate response was shock and numbness and almost a kind of um it, it just killed it it just killed the whole movement yeah, yeah. kent was a kent was a very radicalized campus and there was a lot of weather underground activity in Northeast Ohio. They were mm-hmm. in Cleveland and they were in Kent. And my my publishing partner, Jake, he's actually researching all that right now for a, a book of his own. You, you guys would love Jake. He's just a maniac with that shit. Uh-huh. <laughs> so yeah, Kent was very radical. And, you know, after the shootings, it just shut down. The school shut down literally. There was no more class. Yeah. And everyone was just in a fog. And it was it was over. That was it. And then you have Charles Manson, who kind of shows up in the book. Uh, and then prior, and- prior to Kent, you had Altamont, too, just like not even a year before, which is like it is yeah. like those two events really did like help. And Charles Manson uh, really just helped kind of nail the like hippie counterculture's like door shut with a pile of bodies. I mean, it's really it's really something. And let's remember that Charles Manson was born in Ohio. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, Southern Ohio, but Ohio. Well, it's like, it's so like, you know, the hippies and, you know, you talk a great deal about sort of like these hippies bands that came out of, of Ohio during this period. And then in like, and just like kind of everywhere else from like 70, really like 72 to 77, 76, like the, the genesis of like what will become punk music is forming. And so like you have all these guys kind of like not sure what to do exactly musically. And so like they're going on these different like directions of like avant-garde jazz or like, you know, this sort of like may- maybe a kind of very too, a little too psychedelic rock and roll. But like it hasn't congealed into something new yet. It's just kind of like trying to sort of uh, freak itself out into something new. I, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. But like, like shooting enough speed to where you become like a piece of electricity. You know, it's like it's it's trying to create something. And so like it's almost you get the feeling of like this uh, – like uh, a, a, a match being like failed to be struck multiple times until it finally does. And, you know, Peter Lochner w- was among these people. And Cleveland has its, its, its particular rock and roll history, too. You mentioned in the book, you know, Alan Freed, the, uh, the, the payola guy, which I will say this. I am a full Alan Freed defender. He was doing the same thing everybody else was doing, every other radio station was doing, and they took him out for it. They made an example of it, but the music industry and the radio industry did not change. Uh, and you know, and the Google, sacrificial lamb. He was. He was. Yeah. He was like OJ in that sense. Or just Weinstein. Kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> um, but uh, you have. And then you have this like weirder stuff like uh, Goulardi come out. And, and that is – it's so funny because it's it, – all of these things were kind of happening in all of these different cities in these like slightly different ways. But just like you know, every, every other kind of like major like rock and roll scene that developed in the 1970s, the things that Cleveland feels like it had was uh, a, bu- a, a radio station that would play kind of weird music uh, up until a point um, – a uh, kind of like far out like art poetry scene and a bunch of really like disaffected and bored musicians who are playing like this kind of, you know, Van Morrison type or like jazz type music, but not really feeling super satisfied with it. Sure. So, yeah, let's back up. Uh, So Alan Freed coined the term rock and roll here in Cleveland and the first major rock and roll concert like ever like a big concert was here in Cleveland and it was shut down by the fire department because it was Mm -hmm. just too crazy. And then Goulardi, real name Ernie Anderson, he came out of radio too, but the Goulardi character he did on television. And I think younger people need to know that not that long ago, cities had unique and specific cultural things. They had like, yeah, they all have their own radio station now, but they're all owned by Clear Channel and it's the same programming yeah. right. in every city. It used to be the radio stations would, they would play the Beatles and bands that were being played in every other city, but they also played the little garage band in town that started a band because they heard the Beatles. So there was stuff being played in each city that wasn't necessarily being played elsewhere. Likewise, on television, they had their own, they were making their own programming. So, you know, the weatherman would do his thing and then they'd make him wear a wig 
or a clown costume and introduce cartoons for kids and this type yeah. of thing. Mm. And that's what Goularty came out of. He was the horror movie host. And he was just a really weird guy. And he had this character that was sort of like a beatnik mad scientist. And he made fun of the movies and he interrupted them. And he was just he was just pure chaos. Incidentally, his son is the movie director, Paul Thomas Anderson. Oh, I actually did not really? know. Really? Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. I straight up did not know did that. I know that either. That weird that made wow, Paul Thomas well, Anderson. I guess, I guess Nepo baby. Sense. Wow. His production company is called Goularty Films. Huh. That is, I did know that, and yet I never made a connection. No idea. Well, you learned something. But new. he was, he's not, Paul Thomas Anderson's not from here. He was born in California. So Goularty, oh, so Ernie Anderson, him. he was only on the air for three years, and then he mm. kind of packed up his bags and went to California and made a good living as a voiceover artist. Mm. Like, he was the voice of the Love Boat. And okay, America. yeah. And America's Funniest Home Videos. He was the mm. announcer. America, America, this is you. Oh, that's a that's a real way to. That was an early way to get humiliated in front of a lot of people as yeah. a regular person. Sure. That yeah. was the OG yeah. bum fight. Yeah, it really was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he got rich out there, and Paul Thomas Anderson was was born in California, and he he talks about like how his dad would say like, "Oh, I was famous. I'm famous in Cleveland," mm. and he's like, "Well, whatever, Dad. What are you talking about?" And then they came out here once for some reason when when Paul was still a kid and like they get off the plane and there's just like Clevelanders like waiting for them, just like that. cheering and going crazy. <laughs> and he's like, I guess I guess dad wasn't lying. He is a big deal in Cleveland. And he still is. So yeah, these these cultural figures that were specific to the area uh influence a generation and my father talks about Goularty. All the baby boomers in Cleveland talk about Goularty to this day. And they quote mm. him and these catchphrases. But he was, there was something, and all, like there's not much surviving footage of him, which makes him interesting. Because mm. he can't just watch it and be like, oh, this isn't that cool. Because yeah. it's built up in everybody's memory. And it's become this kind of tall tale and it just gets exaggerated over time. But that's the, that's the same thing with Lochner, though. I mean, that's the same thing with like with all. It's 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 a kind of like a lost, I guess, uh, tradition that we have is like these sort of like local legends that aren't really that well. I mean, Gallardi was like I knew who he was, but like it, it's it's I never seen it or anything. I just read about it in like history books, and 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 these kind of like these figures who produced maybe for like a, such a short period of time, and then either they quit or in, in Lochner's case died. And then kind of leave behind this legend. I feel like it's it's much more difficult to create that legend now because of how well everything's documented. Mm. It's hard to have a mystique. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you just look somebody up, and then there's like a like a doofy picture of them from high school, or yeah. There, you know, I mean, just like I've been making the rounds, doing promotion for my book, and like I'm not gonna say no to anybody. You know, you'll end up doing another podcast and. Uh, they don't have the production values that you guys have. And I'm not putting these people down. They have their day jobs they're doing on the side. But, you know, you could do some stuff and it's just kind of embarrassing. You know, yeah. like, just like – or like there. someone's like, you know, like, hey, Aaron, I'll give you, you know, a couple hundred bucks to you – know, I'm sorting a hot sauce line. You know, why do you – could you make a logo for us? And it's like I always need money. And it's like, yeah, I'll do your fucking hot sauce label. But then someone <laughs> Google. Someone Googles me and like that shit comes up, you know, and it's yeah, fucking embarrassing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And now you know, you're the hot like, sauce guy. Yeah, it's just like, what, but what are you supposed to do? Like, you, you can't like go around trying to scrub the internet to have this like super cool persona. That's, yeah. I mean, well, it's, it, I mean, it's something I think about a lot is it's, I feel like this is one of the hardest times in, for in maybe a hundred years. People weren't really cool until like the 1910s, but like, like, that's not true. No. In fact, two figures that are in this book very often, Baudelaire and Rimbaud, oh, are true. quite fucking cool. Only French people could be cool That's before true. the 20th century. Yeah, yeah, I'll take that back. Only French people were had the ability. Tut, they, tut, 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 tut with Oscar, Oscar Wilde, Aubrey oh, Beardsley. Come on. Oscar Wilde was corny at the – okay, yeah, fair enough. Oh, fuck I, you. Have you read but Dor they were, Oscar Wilde's a bitch. Have you read Dorian Ernest Gray? Thing. No, read I, Dorian I, Gray. I, I don't want to read Dorian Gray. I know what happens in Wait, the end. Wait, you haven't read it? I'm not going to read Dorian Gray, dude. 
That's weird. I know what happens in Dorian. There's so many other books. Dorian Gray isn't, oh, I want to surprise myself because I don't know the ending. I do want to surprise myself. It's like a thriller. It's who's Dorian Gray? Where's this? Where can we find this picture? It's like trying to find fucking Gullardi videos or whatever. You know, you got to go in the attic. But I, and those guys, fucking Oscar Wilde just wanted to be French. Mm. All these guys, look at him. Look at this fucking Yates long- was pretty cool. Another guy who shows up in this book quite yes. often. Yeah, yeah, true, true. I get, the British kind of cool was a little darker. They had a higher, I will say this, they had more, they had a steeper hill to climb, the British, in terms of coolness. There, there was an uphill battle for them where the French have a little bit more you know, je ne sais quoi injected into them. Oscar Wilde was not writing Season in Hell. You know, like that is a, that poem is cool or that entire book is cool. Mm, yeah. Reg- it could have been written any time period. It's cool. It's timeless cool. Whereas I feel like there's, anyways, what I was saying is it was so much easier. Being cool was hard to do. Fine. We can name like five cool guys from before like the, mm, the 20th mm, century mm, mm, and mm, none mm. of them are in America. No American had figured out Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe. Poe was not cool, dude. How, what definition of cool are you working on? Yeah. Baudelaire loved Edgar Allan Poe. Does it and matter? actually That's translated him into he the did. French. Yeah. And That's why po- there's such a huge... Huge following of Poe in France because of this. Yeah, I love, and especially detective novels are huge in France because of that. Which also is has that a, why? Yeah, and they do love detective there, there's novels. also a line there into French, uh, you know, psychoanalysis, and that's why the t- detective story also becomes very. But, but, but I'm I know. <laughs> Edgar Allan Poe was not cool. Edgar Allan Poe was a motherfucking dork. And that's, I'm, I'm going to say this right now. I've known lots of cool, well, I've known a few cool people who like, you can like dorks as a cool guy, but that does not make the dork cool. I'm not saying Edgar Allan Poe isn't a, like a genius or whatever, but he's not cool in the same way that fucking Rimbaud was cool. Mm. I mean, we can't argue with that. Also well, so here's, here's what I think happens is, and this ties into, I think, what we're talking about more broadly, is, you know, you go to your little neighborhood bookstore, the little indie bookstore, and they've got their tote bags and their Mm -hmm. coffee mugs, and they've got the little Edgar Allan Poe quote on it, or the pithy Oscar Wilde quote. And that's what you're seeing, and you're you're reacting against this NPRification. But... If you go back to the source and what they were doing at the time, it's very different. It's like a certain type of fame happens, and when someone becomes an icon, it shifts over into something else, and it loses almost all relation to what the person was doing. Like, be it James Dean or Marilyn Monroe, you see people wearing like Marilyn Monroe t-shirts, and they have a Marilyn Monroe poster in their apartment, Ask them if they've ever actually seen one of her movies, and they haven't. Yeah. Because the, the image, it's this Warhol thing, and the image and the icon kind of takes over and just it gets a life of its own. And I think it happened with Oscar Wilde and Edgar Allan Poe, and it becomes, it loses some of its, uh, whatever momentum or value it had initially. But it's, if you want to look for it, you can still find it. And Peter Lochner was very influenced by these people. He's very influenced by Edgar Allan Poe and Baudelaire and what the, the decadents were doing in, in France. And there is a continuum uh, from the European avant-garde into the American avant-garde. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, it's such a, you, you talk about that, I think a little bit with, in regards to television uh, in this too, because they're, they're the other big people you think of as like kind of being these French poetry obsessed guys. <laughs> Um, Patty Smith, and, Richard Patty Hell. Smith as well. Yeah, very much. Yeah, Patty Smith um, name drops Rimbo in uh, well, I think what's it, Gloria? Um, but and they were all. That's the other thing too is all these guys were kind of like frustrated speed freak poets too. And that that's the funny thing. Before, thank God punk came along because we would have gotten a lot of kind of whatever poetry from the late 1970s uh, if these guys hadn't been able to figure out how to put that to music. Uh, be- well, funny enough, I mean, think, speaking of the French avant-garde, Mallarmé famously said that he was jealous of music because music had another language and poetry didn't. That poetry was so stuck 
to to like the to language that it wasn't able to express itself in truly an avant-garde way as opposed to what music kind of in, was was allowed to do through its language it's very interesting yeah there's a reason nobody reads poetry anymore but they i mean not nobody but it's certainly not as popular. not a lot of people no no but i mean it it used to be like in the 60s you know it was you know cuz anybody could do it really it doesn't mean mm. they were good at it but you could fake it you know, you could yeah. you could fake being a poet. Woman. Whoa, man. Whoa, man. And we had a very active poetry scene here. Um, and I don't know if this is true for other cities or if this is like because Cleveland was so backwater. But if you look at like what they were writing in the newspapers at the mm-hmm. time, um, they were still saying beatnik. And it was like full on hippie time. Yeah. But they were still saying beatnik here. I don't know if that was true in San Francisco or New York. I don't know. I feel that probably not in San Francisco because I feel like the hippie movement was like very, it was almost like a tourist attraction uh, by the time it yeah. really developed. So I think they would have, they would have had, they would have used the, uh, the branding that it, it, it had been given. But uh, no, that sounds, that sounds like a, a Cleveland thing. But these guys kind of were beatniks in a way. You know, they're hanging out in coffee shops, they're fucking reading poetry to each other, they're playing folk music. Uh, you yeah, know, and they had short. They had short hair, respect. and they were wearing work boots. Work boots, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, if they if they looked like hippies, it was more like Berkeley hippies. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a that's a distinction that's been lost to time. But it wasn't like more Berkeley rather than well, San Francisco. Yeah. I, you understand what I'm saying? San Francisco was nasty. You fucking step foot into San Francisco between like 1964 and 1975. Your ass is coming out of there with an STD that could have been cooked up by Doctor Moreau. Your shit is your your fucking your little your funky little pecker is falling off the second you step foot into one of the fucking digger camps or whatever. Ugh, disgusting. I you know, I, I would my ass would have been joining the American Legion in 1967. Good lord. Uh, just playing. Uh, you know my ass would have been selling speed to people for the CIA. The, uh, the, like, Cleveland rock scene, though, developed in this way that's so funny because you keep describing it as provincial and stupid and whatever. Well, I didn't, you didn't say stupid, but that's the implication there. But it's so experimental uh, compared mm-hmm. to others because I'm, I'm not going to – Devo, uh, listen, Akron band through and through, but like you said, Akron and Cleveland – very close together. And Devo was this hugely experimental band, especially if you can find, I can't remember what the, there's two of those albums that are a collection of their pre, like first LP record. Hardcore. Devo, Devo hardcore, hardcore Volume 2 was like changed my life when I was like 18 years. I mean, it's an incredible record. The Devo hardcore stuff is in, so incredible. It's not hardcore it's music to be clear, amazing. but it's, it's, the it's it's, um, incredible but you know you had devo and you had even rocket from the tombs right uh, before pair ubu was very i mean particularly with dave thomas on vocals like this very sort of experimental stuff and like if you compare that to like how it was developing in la uh new york definitely had some way more avant-garde stuff but in a very new york kind of way Cleveland and Ohio in particular was just doing this like in a in a I, I think incredibly unique way. Well, so you have to appreciate that these bands, Devo and the Electric Eels, and these these crazy, God, really yeah. bizarre groups, were not the norm, and like they did not have big followings. Yeah. and it was a very very small group. A more conventional example of what was happening in the area would be the James Gang. Mm-hmm. Uh, who also, by or, the way, do rock, dude. They're great. The James Gang are great, but it's a very Midwestern, yeah. straightforward kind of 70s rock and roll. And there were a lot of groups like that, a lot of bar bands, a lot of cover bands. Um, so it's not like the entirety of what was happening in Cleveland was this crazy freak out. Yeah, that that's true. And like as you mentioned in the in the book, like the main things that the Cleveland Rock Press or the Cleveland Press would sort of point to was Eric Carmen uh, and the Raspberries as like they're like this yeah. is what Cleveland produces. And like I think Meatloaf is. I 
fucking hate Meatloaf. Yeah. The food and the musician. I think it's shit. You know, Meatloaf, the food, no one really talks about that anymore. It's not good. I think that we can. It's also it's was not great 80s, for whites. 90s food. It didn't, the, it, it hurt the, our, the image of the white man in, in, to mm. the world. You know what I mean? We See, had we, to, still, we, still eat, we still eat meatloaf in the Midwest. Yeah, that's like your guys' dish in Cleveland, meatloaf. Cas- casseroles. Casserole. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the only way you need vegetables. When I lived in Philadelphia, a friend of mine said to me, he's like, what do you guys eat in the Midwest? Like ham salad? <laughs> ham salad. Is that Jesus. is that like, so? Do you eat ham salad? I I mean you can find it. It's just cubes of ham like stirred in with mayonnaise. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That reminds me of my grandmother. Um oh Lord. A ham a wet piece of ham uncooked is nasty to me. I guess that's pancetta. I don't know, but that's uh, not pancetta. No, it's, uh, well, it's kind of pancetta. But they, you know, it's it's it, per ubu to me. I, I just to, to I was gonna tell this story in the intro before we did the interview. I guess I'll tell it now. When I was oh no, I, I I'll just tell an abbreviated version. But when I was when I was sixteen, hearing uh, Modern Dance by Per Ubu. Down at the boss. I, I say that people say this about records all the time in a hyperbolic way. It really did change my life. Yeah. It was, I I went out and immediately got a in this girl's house. She gave me a tattoo uh, from the only song written by Peter Lochner on that record, "Life Stinks," which is actually a tattoo that has haunted me my whole life because everyone <laughs> thinks it's a kink related tattoo. Yes, or it's about the band The Kinks, who I also love, but have to explain that while I love The Kinks, this is actually a reference to one of my favorite records, which is. Modern dance, uh, but I got life stinks. I like the kinks tattooed on my arm below the sleeve line, so I could show off that I had a tattoo at high school. Um, and <laughs> a little I know, such a little fucking <laughs> moron. But uh, and no, literally, that's no, it's only people think that I'm just into like butt plugs or whatever because of it. Um, but uh, but it, it changed my fucking whole shit around. And it changed, like, to me, I was like, this record is a, is a fucking revelation. And then hearing Terminal Tower, like the, the singles collection, which has the Peter Lochner singles on it, and dub housing. And there's Terminal Tower, though, I later found out is a real place. I thought it was just a spooky name. Well, I found this out when I went to Cleveland. But I thought it was just a spooky name for, like, a record or whatever. But there is a real Terminal Tower in Cleveland. Yeah, I think a lot of people think it's a fake name. Uh, like terminal as in death, but the terminal yeah. tower was above a train terminal. Exactly, the terminus of a rail line. But uh, which not a lot of people know. Uh, but yeah, you used to be able to like you know America used to have trains. You used to be yeah. able to go to downtown Cleveland and get on a passenger train and go to New York. You used to be able to go to Lake Erie, the shore, and catch a luxury ship and sail to Detroit. Yeah, that's Jesus. fucking crazy. And this is this is like a this isn't like a ferry. There's this is like a boat with like chandeliers being conceived in the luxury suite on the on the the steamer to Detroit. Somebody was. Somebody was. Probably a yeah. lot of people. Probably a lot of people were. That's a great place to make love. Um, you know, it's it's it's. Do you, do you think that Cleveland's gotten its recognition? I mean, you guys have the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but as you point out in this motherfucking book, something I did not know is none of the people inducted in the Hall of Rock and Roll Hall of Fame got inducted in Cleveland until like two thousand eight. Yeah, they've only like for a long time they were not doing anything here. It was always in New York, and at some point they were like, "Can we maybe like do the ceremony here like every other year?" Mm-hmm. Um. And there's always this conversation. Well, we shouldn't say always. There's occasionally this conversation amongst a certain type of boomer rock enthusiast with like a tucked in Let It Be t-shirt. Yeah, yeah, um, classic. Sick. You know, <laughs> yeah, they want like about the rock hall. Like, why is it there? You know, we do actually have cultural claims to it. Like, most obviously being that the term rock and roll was coined mm-hmm. here by Alan Free. But the fact of the matter is we have the Hall of Fame because the city wanted it and actively campaigned for it. Mm-hmm. New York City didn't give a shit. Yeah. They've got museums. They don't need to bring people in. They've got they, – they're going to have tourists. Like if, if New York City got the Rock Hall of Fame, do you think their tourism – would see any kind of spike at all. Exactly. <laughs> what are they going to make the museum of very tall women? 
<laughs> what? New York's got a lot of tall chick. There's like every fucking chick I see in Manhattan is like fucking seven feet tall. Look like a goddamn crazy bird. Well, there's a lot of models. I know. Yeah. But that's they should make a museum for that. <laughs> when I travel, when I go to New York or whatever, I'm like, oh man, the women are better looking. Like they're just even when I would like leave Philadelphia um, and go Cleveland? to Cleveland. No. The women are better looking in New York than in Cleveland. Yes. I'm going to say this. I think cl- women in Cleveland are are f- much significantly better looking than any woman in New York. Are you planning a visiting soon? Are you planting some seeds here? To I'm just just remember. I mean, I was last time I went there was a, was maybe about ten years ago. But I I remember it being a uh, I was very drunk that which may be uh, affecting my memory. And I spent the entirety of my time there. At now that's class. But I, I, my cousin, my cousin was there. He saw you. Oh, sick! <laughs> yeah, it was I, a war, war, was war, that crime, war crime, and I think Wild Thing played there as well. Um, but yeah, my cousin was show. at that show. That venue was actually in like walking distance from my house. No shit. Yeah, the uh, the our bass player got, uh, despite being born and raised in San Francisco, first time he was ever catcalled by a dude was in Cleveland. It was uh, in front of the gay bar next to now that's class, which that bar was sick also, and they let us in. Despite my lack of ID, but that neither oh, here nor there. What's that place called? What's the name of that bar? <sighs> it's got a good gay bar name. I does. It was. I don't know. It was called like the Strut or something like that. Like it was. <laughs> yeah, it's a classic I, gay. Gay bar should be named stuff like that. Like yeah. gay bar shouldn't be named just a ne- normal bar name. But like, oh, it's a gay bar. They should be named like the Boot or like Harness or yeah. something like that. Like they <laughs> the should. Eagle, the Eagle. The, the Eagle is a classic, dude. Yeah. I, I've spent. Then uh, there's an like Eagle in L.A. too. I don't know if it's mm. connected. Um, but we had yeah, one I, in. Uh, I used to live in Columbus, and we had one in downtown Columbus called. You're gonna love this. It was called the Plugged Nickel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was one in San Francisco called the White Swallow. The one in Cleveland was called the Hawk. <laughs> that was good the, name. that was that was right next to Now That's yeah. Class. So I I'd actually just moved back to town, and there was some show at Now That's Class I wanted to go to, and I went over there, and I accidentally walked into the Hawk. <laughs> And uh, it was you walk in there, and it's just immediately like, oh, this is like an old school yeah. gay bar. Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, it's not like you're cruising, but they're not like wearing like leather daddy clothing. But you feel like they have like that night, like one night a week where they're doing doing yeah. the leather thing. The gay bar scenes in cruising are incredible. Where he's walking through, and there's just a guy glaring at him while slowly fisting a dude. I read that it's entire so book. Uh, while waiting for my dad to get off work at the San Francisco Public Library because <laughs> it had, like, a cool leather jacket on the cover, and I thought it was, like, a punk thing. <laughs> and so I read it. was a gr- It kind of is. It kind of is. And it's a good book. The movie is decent, but the book is really good, mm. and it's a little scarier than the movie. Um, i, I got to tell you, though, I mean, Cleveland is, 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 is known for – I think you guys get a bad rap, right? I mean, I was joshing on you in the beginning saying you guys are – uh, it's the worst city in America, et cetera, et cetera. It's not. There's way worse cities than yes. Cleveland in America. I, oh my so, God. I forget the guy's name, but there was a dude who wrote for television. He wrote for Johnny Carson, mm-hmm. and he wrote for all these – like maybe he wrote for Laughing, and he – wrote Cleveland jokes. He wrote jokes about like why Cleveland is just like so shitty. And that's a lot – like a lot of the reputation is directly because of this one TV writer. (laughs) No. I'm dead serious. I'm dead serious. Wow. That's fun. I mean, yeah, I don't know. It just seemed like a normal city. I had a way worse time in Dallas, which is – oh. That's God. a terrible place. Horrible city. I mean, Cleveland and Dallas, there's no comparison. No disrespect. I love Dallas. But Cleveland is definitely superior, except if you're from Dallas, in which case I would say the opposite. But it is like it is a it is a real city in that like it it reminds one of like a city rather than like a weird business district with a bunch of Paneras that are closed when it's not office hours. Um you know, it's 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 so like something that reading this book. I mean, God, as a young man, I read so many punk histories or rock histories, really, and I would like I wanted to be these guys so bad when I was like fifteen and sixteen years old. And Peter Lochner is one of those guys. And then I eventually read the Harvey uh, Harvey the uh, Lester Bangs. Uh, I was going to say Harvey Picard, uh, Lester Bang's uh, essay, sort of like his obituary for him. And that actually clicks something in me because there's a quote. For, I think it's from that. Maybe it's from another thing that I'll never forget, which is that uh, 
although I'll forget where it's from, that, that he was talking about Peter Lochner, that Peter Lochner thought he could shoot so much speed that he would become Lou Reed. And I was like, yeah. I, and I thought that was... Which, s- knowing Lou Reed, I mean, I understand the trajectory, like, I understand I where the mind goes I with do. that. I, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And, I, and it's funny because I laughed at that when I read that. I was like, that's so stupid. And then I found myself unconsciously eventually doing the same thing. But, but Lochner is this, is, this, is this guy who – and there were so many of these guys back then in every city. Like every city had like a few guys who were like movers. And sh- I mean New York had a lot of them. But like most cities, even like L.A. just had a few people who were like these hugely dedicated fans of rock music and not yeah. just like punk, like all kinds of rock music and like really tried to start something. And many of them did. And it's, it's, it's funny to see – this like guy who who lived this very drunk, very 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 drug addled, gun waving short life, uh, with very little real musical output on that actually came out during his lifetime, let alone even within the decades after, have this tremendous influence. Yeah, Peter did a lot, uh, did a lot in his short life, and um, everybody knew him. You know, he was a, he was a well known guy in the scene in New York and in Detroit and in Cleveland. Obviously, um, the the fucked up thing with Peter is he is he died too soon. Yeah, you know, like it, he he didn't do do a Sid Vicious or a Darby Crash. He died mm-hmm. before it happened. He he jumped the gun, mm-hmm. and it's it's important to uh, stress that Peter did not commit suicide and he did not overdose. It was, it's just way more fucked up. He just kind of abused himself to death by 24. Yeah. Like the way like Jack Kerouac did, but Kerouac was like, what, in his 40s? Yeah, and he was a he was a, uh, a poor scene Republican at that point. Yes, yes, he was. Uh, so, and that's part of the fascination with Lockyer, and it's a morbid fascination, but like how do you drink and drug yourself to death like that? At 24. Um, 24 his, is crazy. As his ex-wife, you know, has said, like, that's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it doesn't it doesn't happen on accident. Right. Like, to, you kind of have to be trying to do it. And he was going to the hospital a lot. I mean, he was getting hospitalized, and the doctors were like, you're, you're going to die. You're, you're drinking yourself to death. And then there was the speed, and... I've been told that I don't know if this is true, but that the negative effects of alcohol are just even amplified by speed. Uh, I mean, it certainly uh, can't make it better. Well, better is a subjective thing. I mean, right. uh, the negative effects it doesn't make better. Yeah, it doesn't improve the negative effect. Does it make the experience of both better? Well, that's arguable. <laughs> no, yeah, just kidding. Stop. Uh, but yeah, no, it, I mean, speed, speed does a huge number on your nervous system and like rots you from, I mean, cause that's what I, I, Peter Lochner, you're right. He, he died basically of just like his insides failing, like his guts gave out. And like, that is basically, like, yeah. Like amphetamine abuse will do that in a way. And uh, alcohol abuse will do that in a way that like few other drugs can match. Um, and especially in, in combination, but, but one thing I think that you do throughout the book is like, you know, you, it's, it's, it's no spoiler to anybody who's, who's remotely familiar with Lochner that he died very young, but it's, 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 you place him sort of in this like psychic whirlwind, um, and as a central point in this psychic whirlwind as like this focal point from which all of these other things radiate, almost like the kind of geography of downtown Cleveland, like this, this, all of these lines sort of run up to him and then run out from him. Um, and it's, it's, it's totally fascinating to read. Right. I think in order to understand Peter and the punk scene he was a part of, you have to understand Cleveland, which is why I start at the beginning and talk about Rockefeller and the rise of the industrial economy and the collapse of it. And in order to understand Devo, you have to understand Kent State mm-hmm. and the rubber industry in Akron. Because with, without the context of these things, they're they're kind of meaningless. And and what happened with, with Per Ubu, with, with their aesthetic and their sound, it's very, very similar to what was going on uh, almost at the exact same time in England with Throbbing Gristle. And... And then also the industrial scene in San Francisco, which is Mm -hmm. distinct, but like with Chrome and Mm -hmm. Boyd Rice 
and <laughs> those those kinds of guys. Yeah. The residents. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Not industrial, but definitely eccentric and bizarre. Yeah. Uh, and it's just kind of odd that like it in quote unquote industrial subculture never really happened here. It, like, cause Pierre Ubu just sort of stood alone. They, nobody was really ripping them off. Maybe yeah. they didn't want to, or they didn't know how. Um, we did get kind of a death rock scene here. Like people were kind of doing that LA death rock thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the industrial thing never happened. Uh, and I wonder, had Peter lived, if maybe it would have? It's hard to say. It's hard to say. One last thing before we wrap up, we should mention, because I don't know if we've made it clear, this is an illustrate. this is a comic... I mean, I don't know what you would what say. Do you graphic call it? history? Yeah. It's not um, a graphic there's novel. No fucking, there's, there's no, no word. fucking word. No, I just, we have to call it a graphic novel, which is obnoxious <laughs> because it's not, it's, it's not, not a, a novel. novel. It's, yeah. Yeah. It, um, but throughout the book, I mean, there's, there's also the figures of R. Crumb and Harvey Picar that are very important and influential, clearly also in your own work. Um, and we should talk about them a little bit because, I mean, Harvey, I think, became, got like a renewed, um, I don't know, people kind of, the underground comic scene was very underground for a very long time. And there was then kind of a resurgence of some of this stuff after the the movie about him, American Splendor. Um, but he's a figure that kind of percolates throughout this book as well. Um Maybe you can talk a little bit about him before we wrap up. Sure. Yeah, Cleveland has a very rich comic book history. Uh, Superman was created in, in Cleveland. Mm. Um, so going all the way back, you know, we have that. And yet by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. And I thought they moved to New York and were like doing that, you know, there. But I've seen like their letters and whatnot. And they were actually living in Cleveland and commuting by train to New York, like when they had to. Mm. which is just kind of like unimaginable Insane. that you could like live in Cleveland and commute to New York. <laughs> the world was a very different place. Um, but yeah, Harvey Picar, who, as I understand, knew Peter Lochner, or at least they met, and they were definitely like living in the same area on the east side at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, Robert Crumb, uh, you know, he – he wasn't here all that long and it was more of the sixties, but uh, mm -hmm. one of Peter's girlfriends had some uh, run-ins with him. Did she have a big butt and then he sat on it <laughs> like a cart. He tried, he, he, he tried to pick her up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and she yeah, didn't know who he was. was. And then she went to a, went to a party later that night. And she's like, Oh fuck. It's Robert Crumb. Um, then there's Dave Sheridan. And there was a whole lot of, a lot of cartoonists here. They all left. Except for Harvey Picar, Harvey yeah. stayed. Yeah, kind of famous for staying. Yeah, later on, yeah, I mean, he he struggled. I mean, he was always working at like the hospital. He, he always had his day job. Um, do you know that guy Toby Radloff? He's in the the American Splendor movie. He's like the I, nerd. No. I don't know. I haven't seen that movie in so long. He's like the like autistic best friend in it. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's my wife sees him on the train like all the time. <laughs> well, what do you think it is Just, about this? I mean, with Harvey and then now you, what do you think it is about this genre that I don't know, I feel like it it's like like the genre me or like this mode of storytelling in terms of kind of graphic or comic. I don't know what the prefer like what's the best way to put it. But like what is it about this expression that is because I, I think that the, 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 the history of Cleveland, the history of all of this sort of like underground scene and how it all kind of intersects and changes over decades is so perfectly told in this medium. Like there's something about the, yeah. this, this way of storytelling that speaks specifically, it feels like, to, to Cleveland itself and to these kind of figures. And I wonder if you think that there's maybe a link there. Well, traditionally comic books are – lowbrow and yeah. populist and blue collar. And um, I think there's, let's be honest, there's a streak of pretentiousness in my book. Um, <laughs> nah, but, I, uh, I think, it, I think it works though. It's like romantic. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, no, yeah, I, I like pretentious. Per Ubu's pretentious. Oh, yeah. Yeah, very pretentious, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I like, you know, I like art fag pretentious bullshit. That's it's okay to have pretense throughout. sometimes, okay? <laughs> well, it's, yeah, it's become very on, un- it's been uncool for a very long time yes. to, mm. to, to do it. And it's like, all right, can we maybe stop, like, playing dumb and, you know, maybe, well, like, I, th- I think that there's such a- art. I think there's a, such a fear of like humiliating oneself, a fear that I feel often uh, of humiliating oneself that there has to be this like, like ironic distance between you and uh, like what you're doing or like you can, you always have to be like, yeah, this is kind of lame or whatever, but like, I'm still doing it. My early work was like that real smart ass, just like dirty Trim? joke, shoving it and romp and yeah. uh, maybe some stuff you haven't seen, but it was definitely you know, had that kind of Gen X sarcasm. I love romp. But this one, but you think this one does it. No, it's very sincere. I mean, it still employs irony in, in, in places. Yeah. Um, but irony in like the actual, like non pejorative sense. Yeah. You know, irony is a good thing. Irony is, you know, uh, allows a little ambiguity. It's, it's the opposite of pedantic. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, 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 I think, I mean, the book is funny also. I, I, for me, I think especially it was the black bike gang, biker gang leader named Hitler, which I love yeah. and who, who comes up a few times. Um, yeah, the book is fantastic. I mean, we can't, I really, yeah. I don't think we can recommend it to our listeners enough. I think that they should definitely check it out. It's quite, I mean, it's remarkable. How many pages is this thing? The, you've done, what, 400 and... Oh my gosh, like almost 400 and yeah, 30 pages, incredible, an incredible history. It weaves, it weaves and it bobs and weaves, it circles around, it um, goes up and down and across all different uh, time and space. And I just really, I had such a fucking fun time reading it. I couldn't put it down and I, I just really can't recommend it enough. I want to thank so much, Aaron, one, for making this book, but also for coming on because we never had you and you've been such a part of the True and On family for so many years. Well, I'm, I'm thrilled to have been invited. <laughs> Where can people get this fucking book, Aaron? That's a great question. Uh, they can get it directly from, uh, so I also published it through yeah. my own company, Stone Church Press, which I run with my friend, Jake Kelly. So you can get that directly from us at stonechurchpress.com. And if you have a local comic book shop you go to, if they don't have it, they can order it because we are picked up by the distributor that services comic book shops. Set. So any comic book shop can get it. And we are looking to get more distribution, but that doesn't really matter right now. Well, maybe it does for people listening, but we'll definitely put links in the episode information. You guys got to check this out. And if you own a comic book shop, which you might if you're listening to our show, fucking get this book get in your store. It's book. fantastic. It get really is. It really, really is. Liz, before we wrap up, I have something I want to say to you. Oh, no. Your skin is glowing and you look beautiful. Thank you so much. You look great. Well, it's quite cold out. It is. Does that do that? I don't know. But <laughs> it is cold. Have that I feel like the cold kind of tightens everything up. <laughs> really? So I've been like extra moisturizing in response, which helps the glow. See, it's kind of a dialectic. Let me ask process. you something. Mm. Since moving to New York, I've had what might be called skin issues. Oh my God. I will fix them for you. No. You've never asked. I do. No, I have asked because I currently use the thing that you told me to get which every one? day. Some bullshit like aqua or something. It's in like a. Hmm? Aquaphor? Aquaphor? Well, you, but I you think. need to put a moisturizer on before you. Because so Aquaphor is like more, think of it as a sealant, right? So you want to have, it's not, it's not a moisturizer, but what it's going to do is actually, it's a humectant. So it's actually going to like keep everything sealed in. Interesting. So what you want to do is put a moisturizer on before and then the Aquaphor on top. Gotcha. Okay, so I had to layer it. Yeah, But it's I a do the keels thing. or whatever on, but it's, I don't know what that is. It might not be, well, it depends. We can talk off air a we little bit about what's afflicting you it's because I, for, I am a wellspring of information and was actually just earlier today giving a little in-house lecture about 
uh, vitamin A derivatives, retinaldehyde, and so on and so forth. Should I take vitamin D because I'm sad? Does that is that real? Yes, it is real. But you should get your lev- levels checked. Yeah, My, just go get a blood oh, test. Oh, I know they're low. Everyone is low on it. I got tested. Sure, but, ten years but ago. then you'll know exactly how many IU's you need to take. That's why. Can I inject it? No, no, you don't want to do that. Okay, I don't give a fuck then. I'll take it. You could do liposomal, though, if you wanted. Ah, uh, that sounds fun. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, liposomal. Liposomal. Le- le- it's fun to say. Le- liposomal. You know what? I've always said I take said uh, this. Glut- glutathione liposomal. Females are scientists, bro. But it's too expensive. They are. They are I, could you I do be scientists. Like that? Let them with ball, dude. I, I know a couple. You do? Yeah, That's crazy. That's very cool. You guys are amazing. Yeah. They should be more women. I vitamin think. A, vitamin C. What do you want to know about? I got it. Vitamin know. F. Well, that's Franzac, which that's is my name, and I'm Liz. My name is Vitamin B, injection into your ass. Well, you do want to make sure you're getting enough Vitamin B, by the way. I believe me, I was born yeah. Vitamin B. I drink, I drink three or four Celsius <laughs> at 8 o'clock every night and I can't sleep. So that's a, I'm just kidding. I don't do that. And, of course, we have Vitamin S. That stands for sex. Young Chomsky. Um, <laughs> and the podcast is called Vitamin T. True it on. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.